Thank you, Bill. Uh, next up, uh, Galen Arnold will talk about hybrid programming, combination of MPI and OpenMP. Galen. Okay, so if everybody, everybody could uh, follow me to the uh, Petascale Computing Institute and resources. And open up the next PDF. It's not slides, it's a scrolling PDF. Um, just bear with me here. Got it over here. Make it a little bigger for you. So today, I'm going to pick on Compute Pi. Math, I just looked this up from Wolfram well, uh, Alpha as background, so you can look at the equation. You guys can read the description if you want. I want to go straight to the code. And just to be mean, I'm going to look at the Fortran code. All real HPC code is written in Fortran. Sorry to disappoint the Python programmers out there, but if you want it to go fast, you'll always write it in Fortran. So ComputePy is sort of the quintessential demo for doing MPI programming. This is a friendly enough little program. It fits on one screen, but it demonstrates an important concept that I want to pick on. So while I'm talking, think about what is the bottleneck in this code? It's not super obvious. You know, we can see the work right here. We've, we've broken things up, and there's going to be a hot do loop starting here at line 27. But that do loop uh, doesn't have a big array. It's just calculating and accumulating into a sum. I would put to you that this all fits in cache on the CPU. So shouldn't be a bottleneck there. We're breaking this up and sending it out to a bunch of processors. And I just said what the bottleneck was. Now in this program, it's not a big bottleneck, but we're doing MPI. And compared to the CPU, MPI and the network that supports it are slow. Slow is not really the right term. They're distant. They incur costs and time because they're not next to you. So the hot do loop down below a couple lines all occurs in cache, in a core, on a silicon die. Everything's close together. And because it's close together, we can run it hot and fast. Once we get off the chip and off the motherboard and talking to another computer, which is what we're doing here when we call MPI BCAST, that other machine could be at the other end of the room. In the case of Blue Waters, it might be 100 feet away. Um, the wiring links get long, and the speed of light becomes our enemy. So there are built-in bottlenecks in most MPI programs just because you have to use the network to do some of this kind of work. Uh, so MPI BCAST and its uh, helper routine, MPI Reduce, um, BCAST, uh, one to all, reduce, everybody hand your homework back in and accumulate it in, in the sum. Both are collective. They involve all processes in the MPI uh, setup. And so that can be a scaling issue as you make this program grow, go big to a large number of processes. At 100 or 1,000 or what you'd see on most modest, what I'd call standard size systems, this will scale just fine. Even on Blue Waters, it'll scale to the full size of the machine pretty well because we're only doing uh, one integer. And we're only accumulating one double. So that's not a a bad payload network-wise. But when you get back out to your real science, you might be doing a do loop that looks remarkably like that, but it might be triply nested. You might be working over a 3D domain. And your MPI bcast and MPI reduce might be a box, a cube of cells. Of, I don't know. Could be cells of biology. Could be cells of astrophysics could be cells of water molecules doing chemistry. I don't care what your science is. You might have a lot of things in that MPIB cast or reduce. A typical payload we might see for that on Blue Waters, 100 megabytes. 
that's just middle of the road. Could be a gigabyte or two. That's not considered big on Blue Waters. When you get to payloads like that with MPI collectives, you're going to run into issues with your MPI network. Um, nobody can afford a fully connected, never slows down MPI network. If you built a machine that way, then you wouldn't have as much compute power. You'd spend all your money on the network. So all of the networks that we use in day-to-day -day, uh, supercomputing are oversubscribed, just like they would be on an airliner with airline tickets. Somebody's going to fly standby and have a bad day sometimes. Same deal with an MPI network. On Blue Waters, the oversubscription is in a couple of the dimensions of the 3D torus. On a machine like Stampede 2 with an InfiniBand fat tree, the oversubscription will be because they didn't buy enough InfiniBand switches to make everything full bandwidth in all directions of that tree. So because of that oversubscription, because this is a built-in bottleneck, it becomes interesting to think about ways to alleviate this. One cheap and easy way you already know. You could mix MPI processes with what you've already learned about OpenMP threads. So you could have a thread or multiple threads attached to an MPI process, and instead of doing all of the work in MPI, you could do some of the work with threads and some of the work with MPI. This is a classic case of trying to do that, and that's why I picked on MPI and uh, compute pi because it's an easy code for you to look at and it'll be an easy code for you to play with for 15 minutes. So this is not going to be a presenter talks the whole time. I'm going to take a 10 minute break in about a minute or two and I will disappear for 10 minutes. I will not say a word and you will code. So a couple tips. I want you to add OpenMP directives to this Compute Pi code in either C or Fortran. Both examples are here. If you go to the links below or the links, uh, actually the link above here shows you, that's the code description down below are the code examples is my first reference. So you can go to that link and you can pick whichever flavor you like. Make this just a hair bigger. I want you to build this with MPI. Remember to use your MPI commands that you use to compile MPI codes on whichever supercomputer or even your laptop, whatever. Uh, and then I want you to add OpenMP directives. I would suggest that you pair program this. Uh, pick one or two or three people, get a little group together. And you might have fun doing this two different ways. So the obvious, sort of the correct way is to put OpenMP directive on that inner loop that I showed you. Well, there's an outer while loop here that drives the thing where you enter the number of intervals. Somebody might choose to put OpenMP there and do it maybe the wrong way. Um, I spend 95% of my time learning things by doing them the wrong way on a supercomputer. That's how my day goes. I spent all day yesterday doing something wrong and I couldn't figure it out and that's what I'll do again tomorrow until I do figure it out. So learning, learning things by seeing how they break can be very useful. So if, if someone in a little team wants to mark this up for the outer loop and see how that behaves, see what kind of runtime errors you might get, or does it work but it's not any faster, just sort of compare. And you can mark that outer one up uh, and uh, you can read your input from standard uh, in. So you could have a few input values in a file, like number of intervals. Just set those in a file and say a dot out less than that input file. All right, I'm going to take a break. I think everything you need for success is here in links and in the code. And I will be back at 127 to show you how it went for me. Good luck. Okay, <clears throat> it's 127. I said I'd be back. 
Let's scroll to the end. And I'm going to head over to the GitHub link that I left for us. And I'll, I'll look at a couple of the code solutions. And then we'll also take a look at uh, how this ran. But I'll flip back and forth a couple times between this and my PDF. So first, uh, code solution. So we looked at the Fortran. Let's go over to C for the solution. And that's all it takes. So tell OpenMP that we would like threads for that for loop for that MPI rank. So now we're going to have an MPI rank, you know, one of however many ranks that are doing this. But then within that rank, the rank will use threads to help speed its way through this for loop even faster. Now, I'm glossing over sort of a technical complication here that we'll get back to in a moment. Let's just peek at the Fortran, make sure it's no less mysterious. Same deal. Looks pretty much the same. I just couldn't help myself, so we had to do this in uh, OpenACC as well. If you haven't done OpenACC yet, but it's so close to OpenMP, <clears throat> we'll just do a little preview. So this is sending those threads to an accelerator instead of um, keeping them with the CPU. You notice I left the Pragna OMP Parallel 4 for OpenMP. We can control which one of these goes live with compiler flags. So you can tell the compiler, hey, build me some OpenMP code, or hey, build me some OpenACC code. And so for this example on Blue Waters, where we have more GPUs than we know what to do with, I did the OpenACC. All that built just fine. Back up to the presentation. So you'll notice the last bullet here. I had kind of a caveat. Know your hardware. This is an XE compute node of Blue Waters. Um, it's not atypical of what you'll find on uh, NUMA CTL dash dash hardware output for a lot of Linux machines today. You're going to have multiple cores. You might have memory bound to sets of cores in a NUMA domain. And this gets to be important because it matters how we run this at runtime. So we can compile MPI, mix in OpenMP, but what we really want to happen at runtime is we would like each task, each threaded task, to have its own core. And you have to be careful in order to make that happen. So let's go back to my GitHub area, and we'll take a look at that. I'll look at Stampede first, just so I don't overlook other sites. So this was the Stampede setup for uh, running uh, those codes. So there's my MPI compile commands at the top. So you'll see that I used uh, MPI CC and MPI F90. I stuck with the default Intel environment there. And so the Intel flags for OpenMP are dash Q OpenMP. GNU flags would be dash F OpenMP. Cray flags, no flag. Cray defaults to detecting OpenMP and turns it on for you. They try to make everything as fast as possible. That's why. That's why we go with Cray. Um, and then for running this, I just did an iDev to get an interactive job. And then these are my run commands. Um, pro tip, always put time in front of anything you run on a supercomputer. It's free. And it does what it looks like. It times the command that you ran. That way, if you forgot 
to instrument your code with a time routine, or if you're running someone else's code and doesn't have it, you'll at least have wall time when your code finishes execution, and you'll know how long it took. Um, there's no reason to ever not use time. It causes no harm, takes no, takes no time of its own. Um, just always preface commands that you run on a big HPC system with that, and you'll have one more metric in your output. So I ran this a couple ways. Uh, TAC has a pretty spiffy um, MPI runtime wrapper that they've made called IB Run. Their claim is that IB Run will always just do the right thing. It doesn't matter if you throw threads at it or MPI ranks, it'll figure out sort of intuitively what you're doing and with environment variables and what you asked for in the job, and it'll try to use all that in an intelligent way and, and run your job in the correct way so that you get cores per thread. I believe that's the case. That's what I observed here. Um, I got great performance when I just said IB run my MPI plus OpenMP code. No flags. Awesome. Good job, TAC. However, I do not think that means you don't need to know the hardware. I think that'll be the good default case for maybe 90% of the cases. I think there'll be 10% of the cases where you're still going to need to look up the man page for IB run and decide how you want to put threads and ranks onto their hardware. What arrangement is going to give you the best performance? And it's not always intuitive. You don't always know that you want your threads, let's say, each thread having a different L3 cache. Maybe some algorithms that'll make sense. Maybe other times you want all your threads sort of stuck together in one chiplet sharing the same cache. You won't know until you try, unless you just really know your algorithm. So it's worth looking at the IB run man page and running a few experiments to see if you can improve on your first result. And then I just ran, the, uh, ran it again with four threads, just to compare. You'll notice that the, so this job asked for 16 threads. 16 threads and four threads ran in about the same actual time. That's not unusual. There's some overhead to doing OpenMP. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Blue Waters. There's my compile commands. Uh, Again, the default Cray compilers on Blue Waters detect uh, OpenMP directives and optimize those uh, build code, code for that by default. So it's just CC and FTN. Here's my uh, OpenACC compile line. So I had to load the appropriate modules. You'd read about that on our man page. So it looks a little bit different. Um, you'll notice I dropped a flag here that said don't do OpenMP because I just want the ACC run for this code. And then a couple different uh, runtime setups. So I ran it with uh, one thread and eight ranks, pure MPI. And then I ran it with MPI and OpenMP, same number of cores, less ranks, more threads. So we're still we're still uh, doing the work kind of the same way here. Then I ran it with the GPU. Then I ran it with MPI with two ranks and uh, sort of multiplex the GPU. That's another thing you can do on the new NVIDIA drivers. And then finally, I ran it uh, MPI in kind of a careless way and stuck all the MPI ranks onto one NUMO domain. So they're all fighting for the same L3 cache, and they're all on one chiplet. So what you'll see here is just various timings. So the first one was uh, pure MPI. Second one was MPI and OpenMP. and on down. I also want to look at that last one. 
The last one's actually rather quick um, with the MPI ranks crowded together. That's because of the smallness of this problem. Um, you can get some cash sharing that can be beneficial. So how you place things matters. Uh, you get a variety of performance numbers um, when running this in different layouts on the hardware, and it requires some trial and error to get it right. Uh, we typically see teams, before they scale up, do a lot of scaling experiments in the sort of 100 to 1,000 rank range, figuring out how's the best way to place my program on this supercomputer, and they'll spend maybe half a day doing that so that when they start running production for days and weeks at a time, they're not wasting it when they scale up. Um, so I recommend doing that and, and doing your due diligence um, to see what's the best way to run things. Which takes me back to some deeper questions. So why bother? And I hinted at that with picking on Compute Pi at the beginning of the talk. Um, most MPI networks will have a tipping point where you've, you've got too many MPI things going on. And an early way and sort of a low-hanging fruit approach to trying to resolve that is to mix in threads either on the chip or threads from an accelerator device that happens to be attached to the compute node. So that's where this MPI plus something else uh, comes to being. On Blue Waters, at big scale, most of the large scale codes that we see run this way. So pretty much everything that's more than half the machine doesn't do pure MPI. It tends to be MPI with some threading. So that's kind of the number one uh, reason for doing it. Another big win here is fewer ranks can, for a lot of codes, result in fewer ranks doing I.O. So if I.O. is going to be a bottleneck when you go from 10,000 to 400,000, which is a big jump, then you can reduce that somewhat by not making as big a jump and using more threads and fewer ranks and, and still getting your I.O. done. So we see teams doing that. Another reason for doing this is the OpenMP implementation for a piece of code is just really good. And you don't want to uh, leave that on the table. So if somebody's done the work and you know a code has great scaling on in node OpenMP, then why leave that behind when you go to MPI? And then OpenACC opens up the doors to accelerators. So you can do the same things there that you learned with OpenMP, and we'll, we'll have a whole talk coming up on that. And occasionally we see uh, where an OpenMP code just has an advantage, um, some little performance uh, advantage that's subtle. So that's the motivation for doing this. Um, hopefully everybody got a, a taste of it with trying the pro problem. Um, you can run this, uh, again, on any kind of machine that's got an MPI implementation, um, as long as you've got OpenMP-capable compilers, which we all do nowadays with GNU. So with GNU, it's just dash F OpenMP, and you could do this uh, really on a big laptop if you've got a handful of cores. You can compare pure MPI, OpenMP. Um, you've done well if the mixed hybrid and the pure MPI run at about the same speed. It's very difficult to beat MPI at small scale. So if you get your MPI plus threads and your pure MPI to be more or less the same time, that's a good implementation of just kind of a rule of thumb there. And then in your back pocket later, when you scale to 400,000, which 
I expect all of you to scale to 400,000 at some point, which means you'll have to run it in NCSA machine again someday. Um, when you scale big, you'll have that trick up your sleeve ready to use it to reduce your rank count. Now there are a few things to be aware of on the sort of the, the deep dark detail side of MPI and what does it mean when you add threads to an MPI code. And I did not want to end this without just mentioning this. Um, it's kind of new to the standard. Some of this might be over some of our heads. Uh, other people want to know this information. So just be aware that the, there's some trickiness uh, to be aware of when you're doing things with MPI and threads. Let me just stop for a minute and go back to the code. Let's pick on Fortran again. So the notable thing to see here in the real straightforward implementation is at no point did I mixed, did I mix threads and MPI together in, a, in an area. That open MP is just for that loop. There's nothing in that loop that does anything with MPI. MPI is out of the picture when that loop happens. MPI happens before it and after it to distribute the work and collect the homework. Um, but there's, there's no MPI happenings in that loop, and so that is a nice, clean implementation. What the previous page of the presentation is showing is you've got to be careful if those ever mix. So if that loop had a uh, MPI send point to point in it and it's threaded, then you have to go back and read and understand at least these paragraphs. They become important. So I won't force you to read them and I'm not going to read them for you. I just want you to know that when you do things with threads and MPI, if they start to intermingle in the code, if a thread that's in an open MP region is doing something with MPI, there are some special rules to be aware of that, that you are responsible for. The MPI implementa implementation and the implementors have agreed upon a few things and then for some of the hard things they've said, that's up to you, the programmers. You guys will figure it out and make sure that nobody gets hurt. I've included a few references here. I will stop about 10 minutes early to give you guys a break and let you go back to hands-on if you want, and I'll be done. I do want to show you one of my references that I just thought was really nice. Um, it's this hybrid memory discussion. I don't know if you've, I, I think we saw some good uh, pictograms of memory and how memory can be laid out, but these are some other good ones that I, that I really like. Uh, these reference some historical machines. This isn't like the latest information, which I also like. I'm an old guy, I like, compared to you guys, I'm an old guy. Um, and I like reading about uh, some of our older machines that, that have come before the ones we're working on today. This just covers a lot of the programming models and a good reinforcement of things that you've seen so far as far as where is memory, where does that live in association to where processing happens, what are the connections between the two. Um, it'll end up mattering to you as you write your application and run it out wide on a big machine whether or not you know the hardware layout. I wish that were not the case. I wish everything was as easy as the IB run claim of you just IB run it and it'll do the right thing. It'll mostly do the right thing, but you really need to trust and, and verify that it's going to do the right thing. Good discussion here on threads, how threads work, how OpenMP works. Another quick refresher here on MPI, just tying these two concepts together again. So. 
I kind of looked at this back and forth as I was uh, preparing this. And with that, I'm going to let you hit, have the last uh, few minutes until your next speaker at 2 to do more hands-on work, take a break, whatever needs done. So, plus the U of I contingent earned uh, a 10-minute reprieve because we all went downstairs for 10 minutes for a tornado practice draw. So, which turned out to be a funny kind of tornado. They called it a, uh, like a, a a gust NATO was the word the Champagne News Gazette said for it. So that was, it was phoned in by a police officer and it was a gust NATO. It was not nothing, it was something. It just wasn't quite a tornado yet. So, all right. Thanks everybody for following along. So Galen, there are a couple of questions. Uh-huh. How many intervals were you using for your example in the input.txt? Uh, a million, which is really quick. You can make it 100 million. Or you could run it. Another easier way to test timing and performance is to do a million, but do it 100 times. So that instead of five or 10 seconds of runtime, you might have two or three minutes. Another question Does it mean that hybrid will not ever run faster than pure MPI? No. Because if pure MPI won't run at 500,000 ranks because you've got a scaling problem, then a hybrid program that does run in some finite amount of time, however long that happens to be, is faster than the code that does not run. So again, we see teams that run only hybrid on Blue Waters because it's the only way they can run. They have some other MPI problem that they have solved this way. So scaled big enough, I would put the claim or the answer to that question to be hybrid programming is infinitely faster, there's a bold claim, than pure MPI in the cases where pure MPI can't run the problem at all. So, so you see this with codes that run on accelerators, a uh, similar kind of deal. You know, if you're using a couple thousand accelerators on a big machine, and that's the only way you can run it, you probably can't run that code with just MPI on machines that exist today, on networks that we can afford. Third question. When I go to a bigger number of intervals, the accuracy seems to decrease. Any explanation? Yep. Welcome to uh, math on a computer. So there's a limit to uh, accuracy with doubles. Round off error. And what could be the cases where MPI cannot run? Is it just because of the network? It can be, so there's, there's a couple common cases. It can be the MPI network won't scale to the number of ranks, that's one. Another one we went over was file system. Maybe you can do IO with 20,000 files and maybe your I.O. doesn't work so well with 400,000 files. We really don't want to see you try to do 400,000 files worth of I.O. on Blue Waters. Please don't. Do it with 20,000. There are limits to what a Lustre file system can handle. So it, that scaling limit for MPI can be network and it can be what you're trying to do with files and I.O. It can be both of those. John Stone's got one. Oh, John. Turn your mic on. Another limit is that MPI requires memory buffers that are associated with, they scale with a number of endpoints on a really big machine with a million endpoints, you run out of system memory before you do anything. Yes, yep. John is right on the money. You run hello world big enough and you use all your memory just setting up the MPI so that you can do MPI init, MPI finalize and a bcast. Cool. One more. <laughs>
You mentioned that very large scale code, half the size of Blue Waters, necessarily uses hybrid OpenMP MPI. However, it's also possible the hybrid version will be slower than pure MPI version for smaller scale problems. As we're scanning up our code, do you have a rough, rough estimate in terms of the number of nodes used when we might want to start considering converting to a hybrid version? Obviously, this is a problem specific question, but do you have general advice? Yeah. First tip on that is anything I say is likely to be wrong because I don't know your code. But what we see teams do in those scenarios is they are constantly probing for minimum wall time. So somewhere beyond, let's say, 4K MPI processes, it's probably time to start comparing that with the two-thread version. So you might run... 4K and you might run 2K processes with two threads and just see what, what that looks like. Generally, you are not going to see threads start to whip MPI's tail on small code, you know, small runs like 128. MPI is just going to win all the time. Um, but a couple thousand that start worth, start starting to be worth a look at that point. It, that also depends on how many nodes we're talking about. So it's sort of system dependent. If 4K ranks fits on just a few hundred nodes, that's still kind of small. Um, on an older architecture, if 4K ranks needs a thousand nodes, that's bigger. So the node count factors into that as well. There's no penalty in, in doing scaling tests though and starting to see early on What's the right number of threads? Another? Go for it. For MPI plus X, or X is thread level parallelism, what would be a good model to mask computation and communication between every iteration? Can an extra thread be used just to manage MPI? Cray provides for that on their systems. There's actual, actually an app run flag to uh, leave a thread for MPI management. So look at the app run man page and you'll see some description of that. Um, so the answer to that is yes, that, that is something we see teams do. 